Hello, and welcome to a Draft House Diary for Monday, September 25th, 2023. This is a special Draft House Diary on the road, and I've got a problem now because I think my new favorite Alamo Theater is a thousand miles away from home. I was in Chicago with some time to kill, so of course I went to the movies. The Chicago Alamo Draft House is one of the newest in the country, and it's located in Wrigleyville, a funky little neighborhood near Wrigley Field. This Alamo does not have the distinctive architecture that I've seen in many others, but they have plenty of signage to let you know that you're in the right place. If you follow the signage, you'll find the theater on the third floor, right above the UFC gym. Once you're inside, there is no question that you're in an Alamo Draft House, and it is one of the best Alamo locations I've ever visited. Immediately outside the elevator, you will see a tableau and a plaque dedicating this as the John Hughes Cinema, in honor of the filmmaker who set Ferris Bueller's Day Off and so many other iconic movies in and around Chicago. Just past that entryway, there is a large bar area where the Video Vortex is in full effect. Video Vortex is Alamo's brand for its cocktail bar themed in honor of 80s and 90s video stores. And it's also a full working video store in its own right, with VHS tapes and DVDs available to rent. You can also rent machines to play those on. The Brooklyn, New York Alamo does have Video Vortex signage in its lobby, but when I visited there earlier this year, it did not seem to be operating, at least not that night. The decor in the bar is more industrial than I've seen in most Alamo draft houses, but the chairs and the tables adorned with movie posters are the same as the ones that I saw in San Antonio's Park North location. In the main hallways, the Video Vortex styling carries over into things like the auditorium numbering, and the walls display posters for more John Hughes movies, as well as for other movies featuring Chicago, and some French genre cinema, or French posters, for Hollywood movies. As for the auditorium itself, well, this was among the nicest rooms in which I have ever seen a movie. And that's a list that includes New York's Ziegfeld back in the 1980s. The layout is simple and easy to navigate, the decor is clean and spare and elegant, and the seating is absolutely amazing. The seats are deep, plush, they recline fully, and rather than seeming bolted on, the tables and their integrated cup holders blend seamlessly into the design of the chair. And the tables move. The table pivots so that once you're seated, you can bring it right in front of you, rather than having to lean out to the side. Of course, the table also integrates the Alamo's service call button system. When you need service, you can write your order on a card, and here they were actual thick cardstock, not thin slips of paper, and you press a button. But rather than illuminating a light on the table, uh, because the table moves, the call light is now low on the front of the seat, visible to the servers, but completely out of the way for audience members. I think this all shows two things. One is that the Alamo Drafthouse Cinemas as an organization has learned a lot about how to do what they do as they've opened more theaters and spent many years running them. And also, somebody put a lot of money into this theater in Chicago, and it shows. I did get some dinner while I was watching my movie, and the menu seems to be about the same as it is elsewhere, with maybe some differences in the draft beer selection. I wanted a Beguile Stout, but they were out, unfortunately, so I had my familiar left-hand milk stout. I also had a pepperoni pizza, which was excellent. It was just a little spicy, and it seemed more crisp than the pizzas I've had at other Alamos. Maybe they cook it at a slightly higher temperature or something. Whatever it is, there were subtle differences, and uh, they were all excellent. I also got some coffee, and they did not serve the coffee in a stainless steel thermal carafe, as they tend to do at most other theaters I've been at. Instead, they served it in a foamed paper cup, but it was good and it was hot, and that is key, and I'm sure I could have asked for refills for more cups of coffee if I had wanted them. So in the future, if I find myself with some spare time in Chicago, there is a good chance I'm going to end up at that Alamo Draft House in Wrigleyville. Now, I did not go there just to luxuriate in this movie theater, although that might have been worth the trip on its own. I saw the movie Dumb Money, the new film by Craig Gillespie, about the 2020 GameStop stock situation. 
rally, short squeeze, Reddit revolution, however you want to describe this, without going into too much detail about that whole situation. In mid-2020, a bunch of highly funded, highly powered hedge funds were shorting GameStop's stock. And a bunch of people, mostly organized on Reddit, rallied to buy up this stock, drive up its price, inflict tremendous pain on these hedge funds that were shorting the stock. And it's the movie portrays this as kind of a Robin Hood situation, even though they were robbing from the rich and never quite giving to anyone because nobody wanted to be the ones to start selling and start driving GameStop's stock down again. And that's one of the tensions through the movies. I might be getting ahead of myself here. But a movie that this inevitably is going to be compared to would be The Big Short. That movie was kind of depressing, but it had some kind of resolution at least. This movie, it's more uplifting, but it's not very satisfying because it doesn't really end in any way. There's no final justice of any kind. One of the mean hedge fund people winds up bankrupt and others just snapped up the pieces of, that he left behind. GameStop's stock is still high, higher than it was in 20, early 2020. But the main tension through the second half of the movie are all these people who had sunk more money than they really could afford to invest into GameStop. And wanting to hold, but needing the money that they would get if they sold, and not wanting to be the ones to betray this revolution by selling first and letting the stock drop. The first half of this movie, really fascinating. The second half, it sort of spins into little threads and uh, gets away from itself. But I still enjoyed the movie, partly because of its uh, performances. Paul Dano is he's, he's a, a very good actor. He does certain things very, very well. He does not show the, as, quite as much range here as he does in some of his roles. But because he can bring a certain weird, relatable energy to everyman roles are what make him work very well in this, what made him work so well in The Fablemans, that's that's what made him work so well as as the the Riddler, the villain in the movie, the Batman. The kind of energy that he brings to this role of Keith Gill, who was kind of the instigator and the front man for this whole revolution. It it gives you something to hold on to in this movie, and it's just fun to watch. I just find it fun to watch a Paul Dano performance, and other uh, performances in this movie were also excellent. Seth Rogen as one of the increasingly desperate hedge fund guys. A really good performance. Nick Offerman, he does a great job as he always does, but his role doesn't really have much to do, not a lot of range to it. Also, Shailene Woodley as um, Caroline Gill, Keith's wife. Uh, she, she adds so much to the di dynamic. And also, Pete Davidson as... Keith Gill's brother. Davidson, again, has this, this unique energy, and he and Paul Dano work so well together. They, they create that brother dynamic, and between Keith Gill's brother and his wife, you sort of begin to see the character through their eyes, and they also get to voice some of the frustrations that we as the audience might have with that character. So, uh, they do that well. They're very functional roles, but they turn them into real characters. And one other note, among the executive producers of this film are Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, who you might know from the Facebook story, especially if you've seen the movie The Social Network, which is something else that this movie is no doubt going to be compared to. There was, of course, a pre-roll before this movie, and I got to see the whole pre-roll because I was allowed into the theater a moment or two before the half-hour mark before showtime, which is very unlike the experience that I've had at my local Alamo recently. The pre-roll, it was generic, but it was very cool. It had an information film about sending pictures by wire for news reporting, and I'm talking about something that was from maybe the 1950s. It had lots of music videos, some French music videos that were the same as ones that I've seen 
in other pre-rolls here in Colorado. Maybe I was seeing the same pre-show that I had seen before. I was just finally getting to see the beginning of it. So overall, a good pre-roll, not customized for this movie, but still a good intro. And the staff at the Wrigleyville Alamo, very friendly, very welcoming, very efficient. I mentioned that I was able to get into the theater early. Uh, one of the servers had kitty ears on, very chill, very friendly, but really doing a good job at the same time. Thank you very much for watching. It was fun to share this with you. I will, of course, be back with more Draft House Diaries, both those close to home and from when I'm traveling. In the meantime, enjoy your movies, and when you do, stay till the end of the credits.